You're listening to The Real Investment Show. But we go through a couple of things. One, the markets are very oversold. We've had about two and a half weeks of selling leading up to today to yesterday's sell-off. And again, what you're kind of looking for ultimately is this kind of short-term capitulation. We saw a little bit of that yesterday. And again, big volume spike on, on the selling. And this is something that, that, again, not unexpected at all and stuff that we've been talking about now for a couple of weeks. So, uh, you know, the, you know the, the thing that we said yesterday, of course, is that, you know, if you had been preparing for the downturn yesterday, it was too late to really do anything about it, you know, right at the open. So if you sold yesterday morning or sold yesterday afternoon, then you missed the recovery in the afternoon, right? So you sold, you, you sold right at the lows. And that's, that's the problem with not preparing for a correction in advance, Right, you wind up making kind of panic-based decisions. Oh, I got, I got to sell. We're going lower, and 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 after as much selling pressure as we've had over the last couple of weeks, and it's been this kind of ebb and this slow ebb of selling all week long. Just every day is just kind of this selling pressure. We've wrung out a lot of the sellers in the short term, and again, we haven't corrected that much. Right, it's five percent uh, at the lows yesterday from the peak. So there's certainly room for the markets to decline some more. We are right in the midst of the seasonally weak period of the year. So there's a lot of suggestions that over the next couple of weeks, we get to see more selling pressure. So what do you do now is the question. And that's what we cover in today's post. In particular, it's like, look, markets are oversold. We're likely to get a bounce. There's kind of two pathways, as I said a second ago. We can either rally right back to all-time highs, which is possible. Or we get a rally to the 50-day moving average, which is now resistant. So it's been huge support for the markets ever since November of last year. So now we get a rally back to it. And now it becomes resistance if we fell at that point, potentially either retest yesterday's lows or potentially even go down to test the 200-day moving average. So there's two possible, very distinct pathways the markets can go right now. And look, I'll be completely honest with you. I have no idea which one it's going to be. But that's why we have to prepare and manage our portfolios accordingly. Yes, we can just buy and hold and write it out, right? That sounds like a fine game plan. Just buy some indexes and just let them go up and down. And while that sounds like a fine game plan in reality, it sure makes it hard to sleep at night when you're losing 5 or 6 or 7 or 10% of your money, right? It just, it's, it's tough psychologically. So... This is why we talk about managing risk. We talk about reducing exposure, trying to mitigate some of that some of that draw when it happens. Do you give up some potential upside by managing risk? Of course you do, but that's the whole point of investing. See, this is this is one of the big fallacies that comes comes along with a lot of this analysis. Like, oh well, if you if you try to manage risk, time the markets. You know, you're going to miss out on the market. Well, it's not the case. What you potentially miss out on is the, the big drawdowns that lead you to make even worse mistakes with your portfolio. So, you know, this this whole media-driven narrative that we've got to beat some random benchmark index is ludicrous to start with. That's not our job. Our job is to manage our money, make it grow. That's our job. We have financial goals to meet. we got things to pay for. So navigating whatever comes next. Again, I have no idea. Rally back to all-time highs? Maybe. Retest uh, test the turn day moving average, possibly, right? But we have to have a strategy or some type of plan. So what are, what are some things that we can do right now today? So we're going to get this kind of weak, weakish rally this morning, this kind of dead cat bounce, so to speak. And what are some things to do? Well, first thing to do is move slowly, right? This, this is the one thing that people make more mistakes on over time is they start just having to do, I've got to do something, right? The market, you know, broke support yesterday. I've got to do something. Market's down, you know, 2% today. I've got to do something. You don't have to do anything. And sometimes the best course of action is to do nothing and just wait. Let the markets tell you what it wants to do. If you're already in the trap, I mean, if you didn't take any action over the last two, three weeks, when all the indicators were telling you to take some action, well, it's too late to do it now. So just wait and move slowly. Be deliberate in your actions. You know, make better decisions. If you're overweight equities, don't try to fully adjust your portfolio back to some other allocation model, 
right? So, you know, normally, you, let's say you're a 60-40 allocation model, 60% stocks, 40% bonds usually. But you've been getting greedy. So you're now 80% stocks and 20% bonds or less. Well, don't go try to go back now and immediately shift everything back to a 60-40. Again, move slowly. Don't make big rash decisions because those typically tend to be the worst decisions you make over time. You know, things you can do if you, if you want to sell something, right? Got to sell. Got to sell something. Sell the stuff that's not working. If it wasn't working on the way up, if it was lagging the markets on the way up, if it wasn't performing as you thought it was going to work on the way up, sell it. That's a, that's a good sell. Because if it didn't work on the way up, it probably hurt you more on the way down yesterday. And if the markets do keep correcting, they're going to be the ones that hurt you even more. So bad investment decisions or bad investment decisions doesn't mean the stock is bad, doesn't mean the company is bad, just means you bought it at the wrong time. And you can always come back and buy it again later when things straighten out. So things that aren't performing right, things that are lagging, things that are losing, those are the things to sell. Now, we talk a lot in the past about managing your portfolio like a garden. And when you manage your garden, when you're, if, you, if you do garden, if you don't weed the garden and fertilize it and water it, eventually the weeds will take over the garden and you won't have a garden anymore. And the same thing in a portfolio. If you don't weed out the losers and the laggards, eventually they become your portfolio. There's a, you know, back in 2000, I had the same conversation. In fact, is, is actually when Brent and I had first gotten together, I was doing this, doing the radio show back then and having the same conversation about, at that point, you know, we had companies like Lucent, Global Crossing, and Cisco Systems, and you know, all these companies that were just getting hammered in the markets because of the dot-com crash. And people were like, well, I'm just going to hold it until it comes back, and when it comes back, then I'll sell it. Well, what happened was, is over the course of the next few months, people had an entire portfolio of losers because everybody owned all the same dot-com stocks. So again, it's just, it's just massive destruction of the portfolio because now – all your losers are just really starting to lose. So weed those guys out because weeds have a tendency to spread and populate and take over your garden and choke out your winners. So what can you be buying, right? I want to buy something now. My markets have corrected. I want to buy something. Add the stuff that's been working. So buy the winners. Buy more of your winners. Whatever's been doing well is likely to continue doing well. Be careful about valuations. Be careful about buying stuff that's grossly extended. But stocks that have typically been performing well in the recent past typically tend to perform well going forward. And things that performed well yesterday, utilities did very well yesterday, rotation to safety. But if you've got to buy something, buy something that's been performing and something that performed well yesterday so during the decline, something that, that held up well, that's what you want to start buying. Because money flows are still heading in that direction. So follow the money, so to speak. Have a plan to sell into the rally. Now, we're we just talked about selling laggards and losers, and we just talked about buying stuff, and now we're talking about selling into the rally. If you, again, now this is where we go back. You know, if you're heavily overweight equities, you're out of tolerance, you have, you know, a lot of positions in your portfolio – don't panic sell them all at once. Use the rally to, to start to sell into. Use the benefit of the rally. Let higher prices give you an exit point to get out of these positions and to be able to rework and rebalance and restructure your portfolio. Again, this isn't complicated. It's not rocket science. It's just simply being logical about your approach to managing your risk in your portfolio. And lastly, of course, you know, if none of that makes sense to you, hire somebody to do it. <laughs> I mean, this is, you know, the, the biggest problem that people have is, is, is a couple of things that happen during declines is they get paralysis, right? They do nothing. And then when markets are going up, they do nothing because, well, I'm hoping to just get back to where I was or, you know, I don't want to miss out on the rally. So, I mean, if your emotions are driving your portfolio decisions and more importantly, you're just really don't know how to approach the market and how to deal with you know, this type of policy, hire somebody. I mean, there's, you know, plenty of options 
out there to help you get some assistance. And look, you know, you don't you don't operate on yourself when you when you have an illness, right? You go hire a doctor or a surgeon to do it. Uh, sometimes you need some help. And there's nothing wrong with getting help. So get somebody to help you do it. Somebody that can take the emotional side away from it. Look, it's your money, right? So you're very emotionally tied to the ups and downs of your money. I know I am. Um, you know, I don't like losing money. So this is, you need somebody that can be detached from your personal situation and make those tough decisions for you. So just some things to think about. All that's in the website today, simply go by the website, realinvestmentadvice.com. Click on the Technically Speaking post. We have all the rules laid out for you. And plus, we talk about the different pathways of the market, what potentially happens next now that the markets are oversold. And we have had a 5% correction. What's likely to happen next? Where do we go from here? When we come back from the break, we'll pick up on a couple of those big risks that we're talking about. The Fed meets tomorrow. We have the announcement from the Fed tomorrow. What's that going to look like? Potentially, what's that going to be weighing on markets or not we'll get into that and some other stories when we come back from the break don't go away so talking about you know this correction kind of actions to do those type of things now what's coming up over the next you know days weeks etc into the end of the year that could weigh on markets well first of all as we mentioned earlier, we do have the Fed coming out. Now, tomorrow is the Fed will start meeting today. They will in their meeting tomorrow. We'll have the announcement from the Fed. And one of the things that everybody's going to be looking forward to is importantly is is their outlook for the economy and for growth. So this is the quarter where they release their projections. So we'll get to see what their expectation. Have they upgraded their expectations for inflation? Have they upgraded or downgraded their expectations for economic growth or for employment? That'll give us a lot of clues. And again, we'll also get the famed dot plot. (laughs) You know, it's it's your your quarterly Rorschach test from the Federal Reserve, courtesy of the Federal Reserve. Looks like a butterfly. Uh, The... But that will give us a lot of clues as to kind of what they're thinking and how quickly they may be escalating their tapering. The expectation is between the leaks to the Wall Street Journal from the Fed, um, which they do to kind of prep the markets, and then also from Fed speakers, is that they will announce that they are going to begin tapering their balance sheet. And that tapering should start. Now, this is all based on the leaks and commentary. I'm not saying this is fat. But from the leaks that have been coming out of the Fed to prep the markets, the expectation is at this point that they will announce taper to begin in November, probably to the tune of $15 billion a month. And that'll end sometime in 2022. Now, no rate hikes anytime soon. What could change that? That's what the market expects tomorrow. Well, the situation with Evergrande in China, what's been kind of going on economically, consumer confidence has been very weak. Starting to see slower expectations of economic growth. Atlanta Fed has been revising down their earnings, their growth expectations, and corporate earnings are beginning to ratchet down, as we've been saying they would do since earlier this year. Expectations have just gotten way ahead of themselves. That may be enough to potentially cause the the Fed to maybe put in some caveats into their announcement. They will say, our plan is to start tapering in November at the rate of 10 to $15 billion a month unless we begin to see deterioration in the economy, employment, et cetera, so forth and so on. So put some caveats in there that give them an out clause So when we get to the November meeting, they say, well, you know, we were going to start tapering, but because of A, B, or C, we're going to postpone that for another couple of quarters and kind of watch, wait, and see. That's possible. Now, the markets will probably take that fairly positively. So again, we'll see how markets react after the bell, uh, sorry, after the announcement tomorrow. But that's just one of the risks. Again, the situation in China with Evergrande is another risk entirely. And look, there's a lot of people right now in the mainstream media saying, hey, don't worry about it. It's fine. And it may be fine. I'm not saying I I don't understand enough about the interconnectivity of Evergrande to other banks. 
What I do know is, is banks like Credit Suisse, the example, which got double whammied by both the meltdown of the hedge fund here in the U.S. and, of course, the whole green scale, green shield um, scandal out of Australia. They were embedded in those very heavily, and they're doing what they can to try to recover billions in losses that they took there. Um, what we don't know about Evergrande is who did they borrow money from outside of investors in China? Is this solely China related or are there other major banks involved? And I can't imagine that there's not linkages to BlackRock and Goldman Sachs and Credit Suisse and Deutsche Bank at some level. So the defaults and failures of Evergrande probably have, and again, I don't know for sure because I don't know the inner linkages to a great degree and maybe I'm entirely wrong and it's possible. But I suspect that the fallout from Evergrande may be a little bit broader than the mainstream media is kind of expecting. And that typically tends to be the case. You know, at, at the heat of the moment, nobody thought Lehman was any problem other than, well, you know, Lehman, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a big bank, but yeah, it's no big deal. Until it was a big deal. Even the guys that, uh, were, you know, Hank Paulson and the guys in the Treasury and all the other major banks that were forcing, they were going to bail out. They had, they, they had plans to bail out Lehman, but all, you know, this was, this goes down to an old grudge between Goldman Sachs and, and Lehman brothers. And everybody thought at that point, it's like, Oh, well, you know, we can force Lehman into bankruptcy, no big deal. And it'll be fine. And it wasn't. And that's, and that's the risk with Evergrande. And I think people are being a little bit too cavalier that, well, China will just come bail them out. Maybe they will. Maybe they won't. But my point is, is that there's risk there. And I think we need to be aware of the risk and at least have our portfolio positioned in some respect to deal with the risk. If no risk occurs, fine. We just put some money back to work. But if the risk does show up, we've got some protection. Outside of that, You've got, as I, as I noted earlier, we you know we've got slowing economic growth uh, on various fronts. The confidence of consumers is dropping sharply. Home buying confidence is plunged, just absolutely plunged because of prices and financing, et cetera. So there's certainly definitely some, some risk of deterioration in the markets and in the economy. And that will ultimately all affect earnings. And again, we're talking about a market that's really been driven by two factors this year more than anything else, which is one, all this liquidity being forced into the markets by the Fed and central banks globally. That is ending. Global liquidity is rapidly falling. All this liquidity that we did from the government here in the U.S., $5 trillion worth of liquidity, that's ended, right? That, that liquidity flow is now reversing. So li monetary liquidity in the markets is also declining. That puts earnings at risk, that puts corporate profits at risk, that puts liquidity at risk. So there's certainly some headwinds to markets over the course of the next few months. So look, you, you've had excellent returns this year. Markets are up 18% this year, 17% now for the year. I mean, that's, that's, that's a terrific return for one year. This is, <laughs> this is where, you know, your grandmother used to reach across the table and slap your hand and say, stop being greedy, right? Just, you know, don't be greedy. You've had some excellent returns this year. Think about hedging some risk. Again, the worst case that happens. And this is always the interesting thing about the media, right? When you talk about managing risk, oh, he's just being bearish. Maybe. But here's the, the interesting thing about managing risk. If I manage risk and I'm wrong, Right, So I, I hedge for risk, I raise some cash, I buy some bonds, whatever it is, I'm wrong. I just take my cash and put it back to work in the markets. Right, Markets are going up, I just put the money back to work. What did I miss? Maybe I missed you know, a half a point or 1% of the return for the year by you know, having a little bit of, of risk hedge. But if I'm right and the markets decline sharply, I've gained. Right, I'm in a better position to put money back to work at some point. So 
while the media is trying to sell you a product or sell you a benchmark index or whatever it is, you know, the idea of managing risk and being a little bit cautious with your money makes, if you think about it, just makes some sense. You don't, you know, managing risk really has no risk to it. But it certainly pays off when you need that protection. Just had a terrible joke. I was gonna make out of that. I'm gonna let that one go. <laughs> Something I'm always telling my teenage son. <laughs> it's help you out. Protection's important. Be right back after the break. And welcome back to the show this morning. So let's uh talk about a couple of other things that are going on. There's a real risk that the government will shut down at the end of the month. The Democrats are coming up with a Hail Mary here at this point to try to fund the government through December. <laughs> Again, we go back to our conversation. Their, their big problem is that if they don't get this human infrastructure bill, which has nothing to do with infrastructure, into the budget reconciliation process, they'll never get it passed because it needs 60 votes. They've got to have, use reconciliation to get the 51% vote margin. The reason they call it human infrastructure is so that they can get it as part of the budget. Infrastructure is budgetary. Um, providing a billion dollars worth of money to support newspapers, which nobody reads anymore, is not infrastructure. That's not budgetary, but it's in the bill. So we call it human infrastructure, but that's basically a bribe to newspapers to keep, you know, spinning your stories. That's why nobody reads papers anymore. <laughs> Plus nobody reads. <laughs> that's, the other, that's the other problem. If I can't watch it on TikTok for 40 seconds, I'm not reading it. What's the emoji for that? I know, right? Yeah. You know, this is a big problem, people not reading. It makes French subtitle films really difficult to watch. That's... <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how these films are going to make it anymore. If, if you if you got to read subtitles and, it's, and the movie's longer than forty five seconds to a minute, you're done. Man, half the so, stuff on Netflix is like that. I know. So there. So this is kind of a hell mary plan for the Democrats to get some funding for a couple of months, gives them time to try to get their budget sorted out so they can get this you know kind of plan put together. But again, they're getting so much pushback, even from moderate Democrats, that this may be problematic of course if the government does want if they're and, and but the other problem for trying to extend the debt ceiling is they need republicans to do this and the republicans are now pushing back saying they're not going to do it trying to force the democrats into doing a continuing resolution and pushing the human infrastructure bill out onto a vote on its own which means it's effectively dead so that's a big risk here for the next month or so is going to be watching this battle over the debt ceiling. But, you know, talk about kind of some hypocrisy of things that are going on. I, I thought this was interesting. And maybe it's just me that's interesting. Twitter is paying an $800 million lawsuit settlement for misleading investors over metrics. And while they were doing this, while they were telling their investors that everything was fine, Dandy and Rosie, despite the fact of having slowing growth, uh, they were selling their ins they were, the insiders were selling their holdings. Now, if you did that, you would be in jail. Period. End of story. And you'd pay a settlement. <laughs> you'd have to give back all your profits. You would spend time in, in club fed, and it would not be pretty. But nope, uh, these big major corporations they simply pay a fine, uh, admit no wrongdoing, and then go on with life. This is this is the problem with our legal system. We don't punish effectively for the things that we need to be punishing for, right? So this is why we keep getting repeated behavior. And this is the problem why, you know, this is why people talk about capitalism being broken, favors the rich. That's not capitalism, that's corporatism. And that's what's going on. Capitalism would eat Jack Dorsey if capitalism was allowed to work. And that's... <laughs> Which brings me to the hypocrisy of the day, Nancy Pelosi. She says that capitalism has not served us well. 
And look, there's a lot of people that'll argue for her point. Right now, it seems it seems that capitalism isn't working. But as we've written, we've written articles on. If you go to our website, realinvestmentadvice.com, type in the word capitalism or corporatism, you'll come up with articles. Corporatism is the problem, right? We bail out companies. We don't. Uh, we don't. We we support companies we shouldn't. We you know provide rules that benefit the executives versus the worker. These type of things. That's corporatism. If you allowed capitalism to work, capitalism would solve that problem because the weak will perish, the strong will survive. That's, capitalism itself is very Darwinistic. And markets and consumers drive capitalism. But I like this attitude from Nancy Pelosi. She says, capitalism has not served us well. We need to improve capitalism. So we're, how are we going to improve capitalism? We're going to improve capitalism by being more socialistic. Think about that for a moment. Now, if you want capitalism to work, how does being more socialistic make capitalism work? It doesn't. But here's a woman that is saying capitalism hasn't served us well that's worth $114 million. I'm not sure in what world capitalism hasn't worked for her, <laughs> but it certainly seems like she's doing very well for herself, her and her husband, who have done uh, multiple insider trading positions on her legislative actions in Washington and has made a tremendous amount of money buying call options and buying stocks and companies, et cetera, that were directly impacted by decisions that were being made in government of which she's a part. Again, we go back to the, you know, talking about the federal reserve and, you know, their insider trading that they're doing. And of course they're, using their knowledge of what they're doing to provide liquidity to markets to benefit from it. And again, if you did personally, if you did the actions that Nancy Pelosi, your husband, and a lot of other members of Congress have done, you would be in jail for insider trading. Capitalism hasn't served us well. Not when there's a, div a divide between the elite and everybody else. The elite are participating well in capitalism. Capitalism is serving the elite exceptionally well right now. Just not so much for everybody else because of the corporatism. If you want to fix it, fix the corporatism. This is the whole, this, this goes back to the whole issue of taxation. You want to fix taxation, you don't change the tax rate, you fix the tax law. If you want to collect more in taxes, the top 10% pay roughly all the taxes. I mean, it's, it's very close. If you, want to, if you want them to pay even more in taxes, get rid of all the loopholes and you know the write-offs and all those other things, and you'll collect more taxes from them, but you'll collect more taxes from everybody else as well. You don't fix things by making things worse and providing more socialistic tendencies to an economy doesn't make things better. It only exacerbates your problem if you don't think, if Nancy Pelosi doesn't think that capitalism is serving us well now, socialism will serve you worse. It will, it will only deepen the divide between the rich and the poor because that's what happens in every socialistic country. But that's where we are. Um, so, <laughs> you know, this is, you know, kind of the issues that we do. And look, and here's, here's another thing Congress, Congress is trying to take care of you, right? They're going to start working on some proposals for retirement accounts. IRA accounts will not be allowed to invest in anything based on the account holder status. That applies to investments that require credit investor status, certain uh, financial credentials, or minimum net worth. Restrictions on Roth funding and conversions. Another, another rule that's, uh, or another proposal that's uh, being banded around. The raw structure allows after-tax contributions, retirement plans, which then grow tax-free since you paid the taxes up front. You don't have to pay taxes on the back end. Congress is proposing to prohibit any after-tax contributions to raw structures and workplace plans and ban converting any after-tax money paid into a regular plan into a Roth. It's called a Roth conversion. Why are they doing that? Because they want to collect more money from you. 
Contribution limits and maximum required distributions. According to the House Ways and Means Summary, the legislation prohibits further contributions to a Roth or traditional IRA for a taxable year if the total value of the individual's IRA or defined contribution retirement accounts roughly exceeds $10 million per the prior taxable year. Applies to single taxpayers, etc. Look, bottom line is, is that when we take a look across the broad measure of America. Very few people save into after-tax accounts. The average balance is between fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000, less than a year's worth of salaries for retirement. And people can only contribute four, five, six, seven thousand $7,000 a year, right? Depending on limits. The point is, is that, look, if you want to get people to save for retirement, if you want to get people less dependent on Social Security, because that's a problem, that we have, that's a $170 trillion unfunded liability. Get rid of limits on contributing to a Roth IRA or to an IRA. Allow people to save as much as they want, pre-tax or post-tax. Give them an incentive to save more. Why do you have a limit on an IRA? Yeah, I can, I can put money in pre-tax. I still got to have money to live on. I can't put 100% of my salary into an IRA. I got to have money to live on. You're still going to collect taxes from me now. And you'll collect taxes from me later on a much bigger account when I start taking money out of my IRA. If I want to put it all into a Roth IRA, great. I still got to have money to live on. You're still going to collect taxes on me now, but the Roth IRA contributions are pre-tax. So you get that money now. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, post-tax. So you get that money now anyway. Yeah, it grows tax-free, but who cares? That's 30 years down the road. Less liability on Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Help people build some wealth. Stop taking away their ability to build wealth, trying to come up with some crazy scheme to put more money in the coffers right now. Anyway, sorry, that's my rant for the day. <laughs> Hypocrisy everywhere you look. But don't worry, government's here for you, as Ronald Reagan once said. <laughs> Worst things to ever hear from government. We're here to help. <laughs> All right, wraps up today. We'll be back tomorrow. Be sure and tune in for our three minutes on markets and money this morning. Uh, go by the website. Our daily market commentary is out, as well as our technically speaking post covering the bounce today that we expect to get, kind of what happens next, what to be doing, kind of the rules we went over this morning. It's all on the website now, realinvestmentadvice.com. If you need help, be sure and just fill in the form at the top of the page. Send me your questions, comments, emails. Answer those every day. Always happy to help you. Realinvestmentadvice.com. That's where you get the real investment advice. Realinvestmentadvice.com. See you tomorrow. World. It's a rich man's world. <laughs> so I'm reading this headline right now. I just couldn't help but chuckle. Headline is... And it's not funny. It, the, the headline isn't funny. The headline is that COVID deaths have now outpaced the Spanish flu pandemic, right? Back in the dark ages. The dark ages. Yes. Right. Um, so what I was I was thinking though is is that it's interesting is that you know there's been lots of cases where somebody was in a car crash that had COVID, so we count it as a COVID death, right? I don't think back in the late 1800s that when somebody got ran over by a horse and buggy, they got counted as a Spanish flu death. I'm just thinking out loud here. Just, <laughs> so, <laughs> just one of those, one of those random things that occurs on the show. Anyway, <laughs> where, where's Monty Python when you know, need right? them? <laughs> I know. <laughs> you, why was there never a history of the world part two? I don't know. They certainly have enough material. They do. And, I'm just curious why I, I've been waiting for 40 years for part two. I mean, come on, let's make the sequel, guys. Let's let's get to it. Somebody posted that clip. Send out your dead. Yeah. And Facebook flagged it. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me at all. This is why China is limiting time on Facebook and TikTok, <laughs> yes. by the way. Uh, anyway. All right, back to work here. So just for the break, talk a little bit about the correction of the market. That section will be clipped from the show. That will not be on that will be on the unedited version uh, only. Uh, the bonus clip. <laughs> exactly.